Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to welcome you all to Dreminis this morning. If you're visiting with us, you are very, very welcome, and we trust you feel at home, and more importantly, um, aware that we meet to worship God, and that through his word and by his spirit, he comes to meet with us. A few things to highlight by way of announcements. If you needed a sheet, I hope you got one on the way in, um, and if you want to lift another one um, and give to somebody who's not at church and who maybe doesn't get out regularly, don't be afraid to lift one of those and pass it on to them. A few things to highlight from the announcement sheet. Chatterbox is back, so Mums and Tots back on Tuesday morning at 10. Ladies of Inspire, you have a, an evening on Tuesday night as well at 8. And then on Wednesday evening at, eight, sorry, at half past 7, um, and I've got that right on the sheet, if not off my lips. Um, half past seven on Wednesday night, we have the first in our Hope Explored series. Some of you have um, heard before Rico Tice speaking, um, either in the Christianity Explored videos, or maybe some, even if you have heard him speak um, locally when he's been over here. We have three Wednesday nights. We're going to look at this series together. I have found it helpful personally. We're making a promise it'll be an hour, half seven to half past eight. We'll watch, the, you'll get a cup of tea or coffee on the way into the hall. You can sit down at a table with a friend. Um, we'll listen to Rico. There'll be a short interview called Five Minute Faith, and it will just be Five Minute Faith. Um, it'll not be a long chat, it'll be a short one. Um, and then I'll round up our thoughts at the end of the evening. So the first of those nights is this Wednesday coming at half past seven until half past eight. Uh, on top of that, it's a good opportunity to get to know others. We've said over the last wee while, as different folks join us, um, and as new families come into membership in the congregation, maybe you feel you don't know others as well. Our Wednesday nights are a great opportunity um, to do that. So that's 7.30 on Wednesday evening. Thursday morning, we're hosting the Presbytery Coffee Morning. Um, Reverend George McClelland is going to share with us his life experience of adjusting to a new normal after bereavement. And I know that might be helpful to some of us. Um, and if you'd like to come along and bring a friend, that'll be at 11 a.m. on Thursday morning this week. Quickly moving on, Friday night is the Youth Social at Red Rock. It's at 8 o'clock, costs £5, and there will be supper as well. So that can be spread to young people across the district. Anybody you know um, who's secondary school age young folks would like to come along to that, that's on Friday night. Next Sunday is our Ladies Sunday. Um, Laura Auld will be telling us where the, the shoe boxes went to and telling us a bit about the work of Samaritan's Purse. And then one more that I need to, to mention before I forget. On Monday the 13th of March, so that's a few weeks away, um, but it'll come, it's only two weeks away, we have child protection training shared with Red Rock at Red Rock at 8 p.m. Because of COVID, um, I guess none of you have been at a, a child protection training evening in the last three years, and we're obliged to, re to go to refresher training every three years, so we haven't been able to do that. So if you're involved with children's work, youth work, on a regular basis, then we need you to go along. Put that in the diary, Monday the 13th at Red Rock at 8 p.m. Those are the announcements, um, but we're not here for announcements. We're here to worship God and to meet with him. Let me read one or two words from Ezekiel 37 that I read down um, with those of us who were praying before church this morning, where Ezekiel hears God's voice and God says to him, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath entered them, and they came to life, and they stood up on their feet, a vast army. And at the end of the, the section, in verse 14, God says, I will put my spirit in you, and you will live. I'll settle you in your own land, and then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I have done it, declares the Lord. As we come to worship this morning, we believe that God speaks to his people through his word by the Holy Spirit. We believe that it's only God by his spirit can bring us to new life in Christ. And actually, we need the Holy Spirit even to worship God in a way that pleases him. And so as we join our voices together, it's in this prayer that the Holy Spirit would enable us, that God would come 
and that he would delight in the praise of his people and that our hearts would be stirred to worship him. We're going to do that as we stand together and sing. Come, people of the risen king who delight to bring him praise. Come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of grace. Um, let's not waken up in 10 or 15 minutes' time. Let's bring our voices, our hearts, our energies to worship the Lord who alone is worthy of our praise. We're going to stand as we sing together, come people of the risen king. Let's take our seats together. God hears our singing, not because it's Sunday, not because we're in a church building, but because he has made a way for us to come to him through his son, the Lord Jesus. And it's the same when we pray. And through Christ, we can come and talk to God. Let's pray together. Father, we still ourselves once again before you, and we thank you for the sheer joy of being able to come into your presence through Christ your Son and bring our worship as an offering to you, the one who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, I thank you this morning that our rejoicing is not a, a, an emotional stirring of feeling better about life, but a, an aligning of ourselves to the truth of who you are the generosity of all that you've done and the change that you work in our lives that by the Spirit we come and worship you and bow before you as we ought. Lord, we thank you once again this morning that you're the Lord who, who speaks, who has spoken eloquently in the beauty of creation, who has spoken authoritatively in your word. 
and who speaks your final word in the gift of your son. Father, I thank you that when time reached fullness, you moved your hand and Jesus was born. Born of a woman, born under the law and born to redeem those of us who are slaves to a law that we cannot keep. Father, thank you for your grace offered to us in Christ and we thank you for your Holy Spirit who testifies about Jesus, who draws our attention to your Son, who convicts us of our sin and calls us to put our trust in Christ the Saviour. Lord, we thank you for the way that you've worked among us in the past. We thank you, Father, even in the words of the psalmist, that we can come and thank you for the work you've done in our lives. And so this morning we pray that as we open up your word again, that you would be pleased to speak. Father, enable us to listen. And by the Holy Spirit, help us to respond to what we hear. Father, we ask that you would forgive us for all the times that we have made you and your word a secondary add-on matter for our lives. <clears throat> Lord, forgive us for such laziness and come by your spirit this morning and enable us to enthrone Jesus in our lives, Savior and King and Lord. Lord, help us and humble us as your word is preached, we pray that your voice would be heard and that we would be receptive to what you say. Lord, we pray for those who are not with us this morning for various reasons, some in their homes, some further away. Lord, we ask that they would know that you, the living God, meet with us through your living word and that they too might see and know Jesus. Saviour and Lord, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to read this morning from John 16, and we're going to read the last couple of verses actually of John 15. If you want to open up the Bibles that are in your pew, um, you can follow along. John chapter 15 and verse 26, and then we're going to read the first 15 verses of John chapter 16. So I'll give you a second um, to get there. If you've maybe missed out on some of what we've been doing since Christmas time, we've been thinking about the good news that is the gospel. And we've also been thinking about how we hear that message, how we respond to that message, and how God takes us out into the world to make that message known. And this morning we want to think particularly about the work of the Holy Spirit in applying the gospel to our lives and our hearts. So... Let's read together um, from the end of John 15, verse 26, and then we'll read into chapter 16. This is God's word. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. <clears throat> they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember what I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. <coughs> now... I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I've said these things, you're filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin righteousness and judgment in regard to sin because men do not believe in me in regard to righteousness because I am going to the father where you can see me no longer and in regard to judgment 
because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He'll not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I say the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. Amen. And we thank God for his living word. Boys and girls, wherever you're at, come on up to the front and I will come down and talk to you for uh, a minute or two. Great. Always my favourite bit of Sunday morning when you all appear from here, there and everywhere. Great, can we get somewhere to sit? Right, my first job this morning is an easy one for you, um, and I think you'll all get this right. What is my name? Sam. Sam, great. We're, we're flying. We're super. Actually, when I was born, my <coughs> mummy and daddy, the name they gave me was Samuel. Yeah, we're right on it this morning. Anybody else called Samuel? Have we not? Got, oh, we've got a Samuel, surely. Where's my Samuel? He's a Sam. Oh, he's a Sam. I'm looking at you going, have you forgotten your name? <laughs> you're a Sam. Can you, with me, pretend that you're a Samuel this morning? Cool, come on up. Excellent. I need my Sam Samuel. Excellent. So, it, this is the funny bit of the story, Sam, because um, everybody always gets confused with this. I'm Sam, and my daughter is called... What's my wee girl called? Uh, Begins with H. No, that's not it. <laughs> Hannah, yeah, absolutely. So... I'm Sam and my daughter's called Hannah, but in the Bible it was the other way around, okay? The mummy was called Hannah and the boy was called Sam. Okay, we're, we're going places now. And when young Samuel was about your age, his mummy Hannah had made a promise to God. She didn't think she was ever going to have any babies, but she had Samuel and she said to God, she said, when Samuel's big enough, I'm going to take him to the temple so we're here in church this morning and pretend this is the temple, yeah? And Mummy Hannah has brought Samuel and said to the old priest, um, this is where it gets tricky, am I the old priest? Um, I'm, I'm the old minister. And, and he was called Eli. And she said, look, Eli, take my Samuel and he'll work in the temple with you. It's a big thing to do because I'm sure that Mummy Hannah loved her, Sam. But she said, no, I want him to go and I want to help Eli the priest in the temple. So, Samuel, there's your bed. It's bedtime in the temple. Well, <laughs> tuck him in. What time do you go to bed? <laughs> Good lad. And he goes to bed. Um, and Eli has said night, night. He's going to sleep in church. And then during the night, Samuel hears a voice. Samuel. Samuel. So, up he hops. Up he hops. Comes running over to the old priest. Good boy. And he comes... You called me? And Eli went, no, Samuel, I didn't. Go back to bed and lie down. Go back to bed and lie down. <laughs> Good man. Hops back into bed, and sure enough, he only gets over to sleep again, and it happens again. Samuel, Samuel. And so he hops out of bed, and he comes running over, and he says, were you talking to me? And Eli goes, no, I wasn't. And it happens a third time. We'll not get you to run back a third time. But on the third time, this is the important bit, Eli realizes that it's not me that's talking. It's not that young Samuel is just hearing voices in his head. You listening? Samuel is hearing God call him. God's speaking. So Eli says, Samuel, next time when you lie down and you hear that voice, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Right, can you help me with that? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Right, go on and lie down again. You're doing a good job. So... Samuel, Samuel. And he hears the voice and he says, Speak, Lord. Brilliant, you've got it, super. Now, speak, Lord, I'm listening. And actually, over the next years of his life, 
God kept speaking to Samuel. He gave him very important messages to speak to God's people. Some of them were difficult messages about how sinful God's people were and that God's people needed to come back to God. And Samuel became maybe the greatest prophet that God ever gave Israel because he listened to God speak. Now, this Sam, you can go back and sit down um, and probably do the duty you were sent to, which is find your brother. (laughs) Boys and girls. Here's the question this morning. Samuel heard God speak when he was lying in the temple. How do you and I hear God speak today? Are we sitting, lying in bed, waiting for a voice? Okay, what are you here in church today to hear? What are you, what are you going to listen to? What book am I going to speak? Yes, the Bible, yeah. Because this is what my whole job is. I speak God's word so that you would hear his voice. And when God speaks, there's nothing matters more than to listen. And boys and girls, some of you, some of you older boys and girls, you've maybe been at church or Sunday school and and the person that's speaking has been talking and they've been talking about Jesus and they've been talking about what he's done for you and you're listening and you're going, yeah, this is real. This is for me. And it's just like you're sitting there and God is saying, dear Sam, or dear Emily, or dear whatever your name is. And he's speaking to you. Can I ask you to do something this morning? Because whenever I was eight, I came home from a meeting at church, a Sunday school meeting. And I said to my mommy and daddy, I I sort of hear what is being talked about and I want to be a follower of Jesus, I knew that God was speaking to me by the Holy Spirit through God's word, the Bible. And I prayed and I said, God, I want to trust you. I want to follow you. I want to belong to you. And actually, something that God does for all of us as we follow him, like he did for little Samuel, Samuel got messages about the things that were good and the things that were bad and he had to be brave enough to say, yeah, there are things that are not good, things that I've done wrong, things that the people have done wrong, and we need to say sorry. Boys and girls, when the Holy Spirit, God's voice, speaks through his word, quite often he points out to us the things that are wrong. My life, your life, and he calls us to come and say sorry. And he calls us to come and trust him. And so whenever I was eight, I did that. When I was 16, and I was a bigger boy, I realized I really need to keep trusting Jesus and listening to him. And now I'm 48, which is old, 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 old as the hills. And you know what the most important thing I still do? Listen to God speak through his word. That's what he does. That's why it's exciting. Put your hand up if you've got a Bible. Yes, you've got a Bible with a picture. So when you open that book, you maybe don't hear anything with your ears, but as you read those words, God is speaking just like he spoke to Samuel. Guys, you've listened really, really well to my words. More important, we listen to God's words. I'm going to sing um, one of the songs that I love, that you love, um, about all through history. I love this because God spoke to Noah and helped him. God spoke to Daniel and helped him. God speaks to us. And calls us to follow Jesus. And we're going to sing Noah built the most enormous boat. Help me with the actions, will you? You all ready for that? Okay. And then the mums and dads can sing, even if you don't want to do the actions. We'll not make you. um, But the boys and girls will. We're going to stand as we sing Noah built the most enormous boat. Let's stand. You ready? Let's stand together.
to Sam stroke Samuel for being my helper. Um, I've never felt more silly when I look blankly at my, I knew you were called Sam. Right, let's go back to our seats, to our mums and dads for a minute or two. We're not out to Children's Church just yet. I want to pray um, for others, and this is good, boys and girls, that we do this together. Lots of things happen every week um, in our country and around the world that, that cause us to turn to God and say, Lord, we need your help. Um, mummies and daddies, we look at all these boys and girls, and they've grown up all their young lives in a relatively peaceful Northern Ireland. Um, that has taken a hit during the week. We all know that. And so we want to pray particularly um, for the policeman, um, DCI Caldwell, and his family. Can I suggest we also pray for issues related to that? I've spoken to folk this week, and it brings back all sorts of memories and all sorts of difficult memories. So let's pray for people who are hurting even today as they think back and, and it really gets to them. Let's pray for them. Let's continue to pray for our children's sake for a peace that will last um, and a, a peace in which gospel opportunities prosper. Let's ask God for that. I also want to pray for people who are unwell this morning. Um, I've spoken to one or two of you during the week, aware that there are young people in our district unwell at the moment um, and who face operations even this incoming week. Let's pray um, that direction. I spoke to somebody and, and you were telling me that, Sam, when you pray, I pray for the people I know who are not well. Let's do that. There might be somebody specifically that you want to pray for. And then as we've been praying and thinking and singing and talking to the boys and girls, let's pray for God the Holy Spirit to speak into our lives this morning and into the lives of folk around us who don't yet know Christ, um, that God would do what only he can do. Let's come together and pray for others. Let's pray. Father, as we considered even just a few weeks ago, it is a beautiful but broken world. There's enough in the beauty to, to remind us that you are there. And there's enough in the brokenness that shows us all is not as it should be. And so, Lord, this morning we come to you again conscious that our lovely place where we live is at times a very broken place. We pray for Mr. Caldwell and his recovery. Father, we ask and pray that you would be merciful to that man and his family and that he would be strengthened. Lord, we pray for those this morning who are disturbed in their spirit by memories brought back that they thought were easing to the edge of their minds and memories. Lord, still their troubled hearts this morning. Help us to know your peace and to that end, Father, we pray, we plead, we long that in the generations that lie yet ahead, this would be a land where there's peace. Lord, we pray for those who lead, for those who speak, who take that God-given responsibility of governance in our land. Give them great wisdom from yourself. And Lord, we pray that our children, our grandchildren, would grow up in a land not only where there is peace, but where more and more Jesus is known. Father, to that end, we pray for Kate Forbes and others who as Christians take a stand in public life and find themselves pilloried for it. Lord, we ask and pray that you would raise up more and more in public life who not only know and love you, but make you known. We pray for people today who we know who are not well. Some in our local community who face surgery this week and the, the associated worries and fears. Lord, come by your spirit and where it's your will, heal and strengthen and restore. But Lord, even where physical healing doesn't come, might there be that great sense of new life in Christ, hope for the future and an assurance that you work things together for good for those who love you. Lord, we pray today for the work of your Holy Spirit in our church, in our lives, and in our community. Lord, we know that we can't make anybody trust in you, but we thank you that by the Spirit you can speak. 
By the Spirit, you can convict. By the Spirit, you can change lives. So Lord, thank you for hearing our praying and help us to rest assured that you will answer our prayer for our good and your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we want to sing together Living Waters. Are you thirsty? Are you empty? Come and drink these living waters. And then after this, boys and girls, you can go out to Children's Church. Let's stand again as we sing. As the boys and girls are going out, and again, thankful for those who help us look after them week by week. Um, we, as you know, I think you know, we've got new projectors in, which are great, but we're, we're not having got one thing fixed. There's always something else kicks off. So at the moment, we're struggling to get um, PowerPoint to work, which means that I'm not able to use the screens just at the moment um, with headers for what I'm saying to you. So I'm sorry, can't do that this morning, um, but God willing, we'll get that sorted in the next week or two and they will be fully functional with the computer for PowerPoint. I heard of a wee girl this week uh, and this did my heart good. Um, she was telling somebody about a book that she was getting to read at home and she was explaining, a very young child actually, explaining that this book was about God and then... A bit more, she said, and it's about more than God. It's about his son, and the conversation went further. His, his son? Yeah, his son, Jesus. And then the, the child went a bit further again and said, it's about God, and it's about Jesus, and it's about, and then they were struggling a wee bit, and then their eyes lit up. It's about God and about Jesus and about the Spirit of God. And I smiled to hear that story. Um, I'm pleased. I don't know where that house was, who that child was, but there was a book and it must have been a good book that was speaking of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of God. <clears throat> I've said to you before, and I say again this morning, we are Trinitarian in our belief, beliefs. The, the, the great I am of the Old Testament, the, the one who is re revealed to us in Scripture, is God with his special holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can get bad press, especially um, sometimes as Presbyterians, we, we shy away from what we see as the excesses of 
maybe groups of Christians who, who emphasize gifts of the Spirit and things that we're maybe a wee bit uncomfortable with. And, and so we find ourselves going, oh, maybe just easier to leave that in a box for that Pentecostal group over there. The danger is the other side of that is to simply ignore the Holy Spirit. And say, oh, we generally have our beliefs, but we'll not talk about the Holy Spirit. If you know the great creeds of our faith to which we assign our commitment, I believe in God the Father. I believe that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is active from the off in Scripture. God the Spirit broods over the emptiness before the world is formed by the Spirit. The prophets, like Samuel, spoke not their words, but as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit of God. When kings and leaders and judges were raised up to lead, they were enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit to make judgment, to win battles with the aid of the Holy Spirit. Then you come to the New Testament. When Jesus is born, when the gospel is revealed to us, how does it happen? Well, the, the very beginning of it, Luke chapter 1, verse 35, uh, and Mary, a young girl, is on her own, and what happens? The angel comes, and what does the, the angel say? Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you, and you will conceive by the Spirit. And the one you give birth to will be called the Son of the Most High. When Jesus begins his ministry at his baptism, the Holy Spirit comes, resting pictorially as a dove. And God speaks, you are my son. With you I'm well pleased. When Jesus goes out after temptation to return to Galilee to minister, Luke 4 verse 14, what happens? He returns to Galilee, how? In the power of the Holy Spirit, equipped, enabled, filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Amazingly, even when Christ is crucified, Hebrews 9 verse 14, the, Hebrew, the writer of the Hebrews explains what was happening, saying that the blood of Jesus Christ is being offered through the eternal spirit. You see, the, the Holy Spirit is involved in the establishment of our world from beginning to end, and the Holy Spirit is at work in the, the coming of Christ for you and for me. But more than that, and this is what I want to talk to you about this morning, the Holy Spirit has not only established salvation for us in Jesus Christ, it's also the Holy Spirit who applies to you this message of the gospel and what Christ has done for you. No one, and I mean no one, can become a Christian and, and use whatever label you want to use this morning. No one can be born again. No one can call themselves made new in Christ. No one can call themselves a believer in Jesus. No one can say, I am safe and saved unless by the agency of the Holy Spirit. And so what I want to do this morning for a minute or two is work through with us from God's word how the Holy Spirit applies the truth of the gospel and makes real to our lives and our hearts what God has done for us in Christ. And as I've looked through this and journeyed through it this week, it excites me because there is a great clarity and unity in God's word speaking to us of what God is doing by his spirit for your and my salvation. It's not something that's hidden and obscure. This is up front and central. And so this morning, um, it's my prayer that we would see what God is doing by his spirit. And maybe, even for someone this morning, God would do what I'm talking about for you today. And God would apply the benefits of what God, what he has done in Christ to you personally by the Holy Spirit. Five words, and I wish I could put them on the screen. Convinces, convicts, converts, conforms, contents. Let me take them one at a time um, and journey through with you what God does for us. By the Holy Spirit, God convinces me of the identity of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. You ask me, Sam, what is the first and primary ministry or work of the Holy Spirit? In a blink, I will say to you, the work of the Holy Spirit is to point people to Jesus Christ. Let me take you again to the Bible. John 14, verse 26. That lovely passage that I would quite often read at a graveside. And when Thomas says to Jesus, 
Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how will we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way. And then he promises that after he has gone, he will give them the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so in John 14, verse 26, Jesus says to his disciples, the spirit of truth will come and he will teach you all things. And then this, he will remind you of everything I have spoken. The Holy Spirit will stir your hearts towards all that Jesus has said about himself. That's what the Holy Spirit does. John 15, verse 26. He, the Holy Spirit, is sent from the Father, we read it a moment ago, to testify about me. The Holy Spirit is going to speak. He's going to bear witness. At Jesus' baptism, the Spirit testifies that this is the Son of the Father. Actually, and, and this is the bit that maybe I need to emphasize to you, John 16, verse 14 the Spirit, Jesus says, will bring glory to me. The, the, the Spirit is constantly deflecting attention away from himself, and he's a, a person. It's, it's not the it. It's not a, a thing. We believe in a God of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he, the Holy Spirit, is deflecting attention away from himself and shining the light on Jesus, the Son of God. He's a deflector of attention. This is why, um, hence my frustration at times, with attention-seeking supposed Holy Spirit activity, where the, the thing itself is, Holy Spirit, we're going to get excited in the Holy Spirit, we're going to do this in the Holy Spirit. You're on dangerous line there because Scripture teaches that the Holy Spirit is a deflector of attention to the person of Jesus. So, applying it, when you find your heart stirred by the wonder maybe of creation and all that you see, when you find yourself thinking about God and about Jesus Christ and about the gospel, it's the Holy Spirit who is stirring your thinking. When you listen to preaching and you find yourself unintentionally drawn in and you find yourself wondering about who this Christ is and the beauty of all that he is and all that he has done and all that he offers and it's truth and it's reality, it's the Holy Spirit who is convincing you. When you listen to someone share a Jesus testimony on a Sunday night at Real Life Faith or on a five-minute faith at Hope Explored during the week or when a friend of yours has the courage to speak to you of what Christ has done for them and your heart is warmed and you're going, yeah, there's something that rings true in this. It's God, the Holy Spirit, who's ministering to you. It happens again and again in Scripture and it happens again and again today. I love the story, the, the passage on Easter Sunday night in the Emmaus Road when Jesus comes to the, two, to the two individuals who had been following him and then they've given up and they're walking back to their home village and they meet the resurrected Jesus and he speaks to them and what does he do? The thing just keeps coming back. He opens up the scriptures and beginning with Moses and the prophets, he shows how these scriptures speak of him. And the two people, as they, they walked along and later on when, when Jesus was taken away from them again after they'd eaten with him, they said to each other, what did they say? Didn't our heart burn within us as he spoke to us on the road? What was happening? God, the Holy Spirit, through the word of God, was opening their eyes to see the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, the Son of God. And it happens again and again and again. It's what happened in Pentecost when Peter preaches and he preaches Jesus from the Old Testament and the Spirit moves and people are convinced of Christ. Have you ever been told, and somebody said to you, would you stop and think? And I've been told many times when I'm being a headstrong male and barging on to do the next thing, would you stop and think? And I stop myself and I slow down and I think what I should do next. <coughs> Some of you this morning, I believe that God by the Holy Spirit is getting you to stop and think. The Holy Spirit is getting you to look at who Jesus is. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, to shine a torchlight on Jesus. His birth, his baptism, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And whenever he is preached, the Holy Spirit is where it puts a main beam on the person of Jesus. Can I venture to say this morning, even by virtue of your attendance at church after menace, <laughs> once or 150 times, God has been in some way convincing you of the truth of who Jesus is. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. 
He convinces. But he does more. The second word is he convicts me of my sin and my need of Christ. Can I say lovingly to you this morning, it's not just enough to know who Jesus is and what he did. That in itself is good, but it doesn't make you a Christian. Again, can I get you to stop and think? Have you got that yet? You're here at church and you say, yeah, look, I go to Draminis, they preach the Bible, they preach the gospel. I've heard it and, and you maybe even go as far as to say, I'd be quite convinced that what we say and believe is true, that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you realize yet that that in itself doesn't make you a Christian? You see, the Holy Spirit does more than just convince you of who Jesus is. The Holy Spirit convicts you of who you are and what Christ has done. That's why I read John 16, where Jesus says that I will leave and go and the advocate will come. And when he comes, John 16, verse 8, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. He will convict of sin and righteousness and the judgment to come. The Holy Spirit helps me by, first of all, hurting me, by disturbing my conscience. He shows me my sinfulness and my selfishness. He exposes it. He shines a penetrating light into the depths of my heart. He makes it painfully difficult to enjoy sinning. And instead of being careless and carefree and do my own thing, something begins to eat away. It's as if my conscience has been pricked and I'm uneasy in who I am, even ashamed of who I am. The Holy Spirit convicts us. It's like the judge when you have been speeding or whatever other misdemeanor you've been getting up to and they bring you in and they say, you're the boy, you're the man. You're convicted of the crime. There's no escaping it. That's what God does by the Holy Spirit. He convicts your heart of the reality of who you are before him. More than that, he convicts not just of your sin, but of righteousness. That Jesus is the righteous one who never sinned and he did that for you. He is the means by which you and me who know our sin can be made righteous. More than that, he convicts you of the reality that judgment day is coming. Hebrews 10, 27, it's been appointed unto man once to die. And then the judgment. It's the Holy Spirit who shows you who you are, who shows you who Jesus is, and who prompts you to think and to realize that there's a day coming when you'll breathe your last. That is what Jesus is talking about when he says the Holy Spirit will convict the world in relation to sin, righteousness of Christ, and the judgment that's yet to come. Does it stop you in your tracks? Because if it is, and it does, it's the most precious unease that you'll ever experience. It's not a bad thing, it's the most wonderfully good thing. Whether it's through preaching, whether it's when you sit down on your own later on today, whether it's when the challenge of a friend pricks at you as to who you are without Christ. Who does that for you? The minister? No. Your friend who cares about you? Well, not really. God, the Holy Spirit. In one sweep, he enables me to see me for who I am, to see Christ for who he is, to see the impending reality of my final breath, to see the mess, to see my need, and amazingly to see the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, that he has died in my place. He has died that I might be forgiven. The older generation spoke rightly of being under conviction. John Newton, while he was still slave trading, expressed it this way. He said it was as if the hound dog of heaven was on his trail. Who was he talking about? Not some pup chasing at his heels, but God the Holy Spirit who was up behind him, I say it reverently, yapping at his conscience. That's what God the Holy Spirit does. Have you ever spoken of a child and you say that they're sickening for something or there's something working on them? Those are phrases that I've learned over 20 years in, in County Armagh. It's like that with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're at some stage of that journey where the Holy Spirit is working on you. Can I explain to you what is happening? He's convicting you of your sin and of the righteousness of Jesus and of, yes, the reality of judgment day to come and he's doing it 
for your own sake. He convinces me, he convicts me, and then critically and centrally, he converts me. Sam, what do you mean? Is this becoming Christ a Christian business? Is that not just my decision? Is that not just something I do when I hear this and go, yeah, yeah, I think I'll do that? No, it's not quite like that. Let me explain, let me show you scripture and then try as best I can to explain it. What does it mean to be converted? To be changed? To be saved, to be born again, whatever word you want to use. Well, in John 3, Jesus meets with Nicodemus and has this great conversation about being born again. And Jesus explains to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you were born once of the flesh and no, you don't have to go back into your mother's womb again and be born again physically. Nicodemus, you need a second birth of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. Nicodemus, as you hear this message and respond to it in faith, God will do something in you and rebirth you. Ephesians 2, 5 and 6, God makes us alive even while we were still dead in our sins. He raises us up with Jesus Christ. It's the language of, of a personal, powerful resurrection. Just like Jesus was buried and raised, so God says by the Spirit, you're dead in your sins and you're going to be made alive. These things of God are going to bring you to new life in him. Titus 3, verse 5, he saved us. God saved us. How did he do it? By the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, having believed in Jesus, you're marked with a seal, and what is that seal? The promised gift of the Holy Spirit. God himself enabling me to believe and coming to dwell in me. The Holy Spirit who convinces you of who Jesus is, the Holy Spirit who convicts you of your sin, is the Holy Spirit who converts you, who changes you who transforms you and your standing, it is an act of God and his grace. You can't do it for yourself. Can I inadequately illustrate it to you? I don't own any old barns. Anybody here old and own an old barn? I mean, I don't mean one of those corrugated gated iron ones. I mean a lovely old stone barn. And you look at it and it's mucky and dirty and it's falling down. But you think, yeah, wouldn't it be lovely and the phrase is a barn conversion. And you're not going to go out and put your sleeping bag and, and, and lie down in the muck. That's not what you want. But you look at it and you see the, the building and you go, yeah, yeah, this, this could be made into something. This could be changed. This could be converted. And you see the drawings that the architect shows you. And you go, yeah, that possibly could happen. And then more than that, mentally and emotionally yourself, you go, I would actually like that. I, I, I think this would be great. You're persuaded, you're convinced, you're convicted that, yeah, I, I might, as it were, part with my money and make this happen. But there then comes a moment where you commit to it and you entrust it all to the builder. And he takes it off your hands and out of your hands and does what you cannot do. <coughs> And he converts the barn into something that is not a barn, it's a house. Now, I accept it's an inadequate illustration, so don't um, pick all the holes in it. But you see what could be. You're persuaded that, yes, this would be a good thing. And then you entrust it to someone who can do it for you. That's the gospel. And maybe there's somebody here today, and you know that your, your life is a bit more rumbled down, broken, dirty barn. But you know that the gospel is the good news of a God who can take the broken and the dirty and the falling apart. And he can convert it. He can change you. More than that, he not only makes you a new creation, but he comes to dwell with you and in you. Time and time again, God's word has convinced me that Jesus is the Son of God. Time and time again, the Holy Spirit has convicted me of my sin and my need of the righteous one, Jesus. And I thank God that by the Spirit and his power, he has converted me. He's done what I can't do by the Holy Spirit. And I can say this morning, I am born of God because of what God has done in me and for me by the Spirit. And he would do that for you. 
as he convicts you, and then as you surrender the, the, the life that you have into his hands, he says, yeah, I can change you. I can bring you to new life. And when he does that, he conforms me. I'm going to run out of time, but in a word, he, he conforms me. Scripture never paints a picture of good old Northern Ireland saved and stuck with your ticket in hand at the bus stop waiting for heaven. No, Scripture is always a journeying on with Jesus. The God who convicts me and converts me has a plan for my life. Romans 8 verse 28. You all can quote, now here's the bit that interests me. You could probably all quote Romans 8 28. In all things God works together, it works for the good of those he has called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? Verse 29 of Romans 8, the very next verse, that you would be conformed to the likeness of his son. God does not call you to himself, convict you of your sin, change you by a work of the Holy Spirit, converting you, that you could then dawdle off in your own direction and say, well, I'll just do whatever I want until the last whistle blows and it's time for heaven. No, God converts you, changes you, that he might make you like Jesus. As in Romans 8, that the old self would be crucified. You'd become dead to sin, joined to Jesus in the resurrection, no longer a slave to my sinful old self, but counting it dead and living to Christ. And you might stop me there and say, Sam, that's fine. I know that that's what God has designed for me. I know that's what God desires, but Sam, I just can't do it. I muck up, I get it all wrong, I go off course. How can this conforming to be like Jesus happen? Well, Galatians 5 and Romans 8 explains to us that we live by the Spirit so that we would not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Verse 25, that we would keep in step with the Spirit. At 48, I'm more near the finishing line than the starting line of life, never mind faith. You ask me, Sam, how do you keep in step with the Spirit? And I often don't. How do you keep in step with the Spirit? Well, you open up His Word and you let God speak by His Word to your heart that you would keep in step. You gather with regularity in worship with God's people so that you would not only hear God's Word, but that His Spirit would speak to you through His Word, that you would be gathered together with those who love Him and shaped in His likeness even as we worship and serve together. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep within, shape and fashion us in your likeness. It's my prayer ongoing for our church, that God would be using his word to challenge and shape and mold us. That the spirit of the living God would fall, breaking, melting, molding and filling. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life in you. That I would love what thou dost love do what you would do. A people conformed and a people content. By the Holy Spirit, I know that I belong to Jesus. Romans 8, 16, his spirit testifies with my spirit, enabling me to pray, Abba or Father. Um, when you become a Christian, when the convincing and convicting and converting work of God is done in you and he's beginning to conform you into the likeness of his son, then with it comes a strange contentment by the Holy Spirit that enables you to speak to him as father. And you know he's your father. And you know that he hears you as his child. And there's a peace in it. And little by li little he ministers to us on an ongoing basis with gentle, re gentle realigning our lives, gently convicting us, forming Christ in us drawing me to him to pray, delighting me in all that he is and all that he has done, reassuring me that I am his and he is mine. He pacifies us and reassures us. It's literally, I think it was on one of the Psalms that I'd written during lockdown, um, and a photograph, a super photograph of my sister Heather and Zoe, my niece, and Zoe is electric. She is wired to the moon. She's calmed a wee bit. If Heather's watching this, Heather, sorry. Um, Zoe, just mad Zoe. She just, go, 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 go. But when she gets tired at the end of the day, and she would just come and sit on her mother's knee and come in close. And she's like a pacified, calmed, reassured child in the embrace of their mother, 
knowing who they are, are the peace. In a broken, confused, messed up, mucked up, sinful world, God not only wants to convince you of who Jesus is, convict you of your sin, convert you by his Holy Spirit power, conform you to the likeness of his son, he also wants to content your heart in him. That you're like the weaned child of the Psalms, resting in your father's embrace, trusting that you're his child. And God does that by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that a wonderful, wonderful, precious thing? You don't get that anywhere else. You will not find that anywhere else. You'll not find it in education. You'll not find it in social policy. You'll not find it in money. I had a great conversation yesterday um, with somebody about two people about money and the realization that it will not give you the peace that only God gives you in Christ. God works by his spirit for your good. Father, we still ourselves before you and I thank you that you have committed to revealing yourself even as your word is preached. And so Lord, for some of us this morning in a way that we maybe didn't quite expect this good news, this gospel truth hits us in a fresh way. And Father, I thank you that Faithful are the wounds of our heavenly friend. That you prick our conscience and you stir our hearts. And in some ways you wound us, make us aware of our sin. That by the Holy Spirit you might heal us and forgive us, clean us out and come to dwell in us. And so Lord, this morning I pray that we would be Listening like long, young Samuel in the temple. Speak, Lord. I'm listening. Come. Change me. Transform me. Make me new. Lord, thank you for the joy that it is to belong to Jesus. For the peace and the contentment and the future hope that's ours in Christ. And we pray that you would be working among us by the Holy Spirit. To the glory of your Son. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to finish and sing an older hymn, but very, very appropriate. God has spoken by his prophets, spoken his unchanging word, each from age to age proclaiming, God the one, the righteous Lord. I think if I'm right, there's a verse, God is speaking by his spirit. Let's stand as we sing.
now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the wonderful love of God, and the life-changing ministry of God the Holy Spirit rest and remain with us today and forevermore. Amen.